I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. In this episode, you're going to meet another of my heroes whose name has been lost to history. Herb Selwyn was a knight in shining armor for the fledgling LGBT civil rights movement on the West Coast. He was an attorney from Southern California who had no personal stake in fighting for the rights of gay people. But he couldn't turn the other way and stood up for LGBT folks during the years when other straight attorneys cashed in on the persecution of gay people and gay attorneys were too fearful, and with good reason, to stick their necks out for a despised minority. At the time, Herb had no idea how many lives his work would touch or what his foundational contributions to the early movement would mean to the people he loved best. When Herb gave me his address in the Studio City neighborhood of Los Angeles, it sounded familiar. And sure enough, he lives around the corner from my friend and fellow author, Betty Brazan. I pull into the driveway of a classic, single-story, flat-roofed, mid-century house with a few palm trees in the front yard. And before I reach the Spanish-style double front doors, Herb is there to greet me. Herb's a little guy in glasses who makes me feel very tall, and I'm not tall. And he makes me feel welcome. We get set up in Herb's study, I clip my microphone to his light blue jumpsuit and press record. Interview with Herb Selwyn, Thursday, August 24th, 1989. Location is Los Angeles, California. Interviewer is Eric Marcus, tape one, side one. My parents uh, were not never uh, homophobic. They explained to me uh, that, you know, some people have different predilections than others. And, um, you know, the good old story that Socrates said about the people being paired up and uh, because of the disobedience, the gods had scattered them and they're still searching for their mate. You know, a woman for a woman, a man for a man, a woman for a man, so on. And uh, we knew that there were, for example, gay bars, um, in, in the area. Then during the war, I remember um, a young soldier was arrested and sentenced to a lot of years because he'd had a relationship with a teenage English boy. And uh, I told the major that I thought it was rather unjust that he get that much time and uh, because the kid was willing and all that, and that he should be sent for psychotherapy instead. You know, and the major made some nasty crack about, well, you guys ought to go out and psychoanalyze each other or something like that. And Did then, he just assume you were you were one of them? Oh, no, no, no. no. He knew I wasn't, but uh, he, he just felt it was improper for me to take up for them because he felt he's one of these guys that thought, well, this is beyond the pale. Wasn't that sticking your neck out? Oh, I've always stuck my neck out. I never uh -huh. bothered about that. I, I probably was uh, uh, not the most uh, disciplined soldier in the uh, armed forces there, because I always said what I thought, and I, I didn't care to whom I said it. I, I still don't. I, I talk too much sometimes. At any rate, um, after finishing law school, I opened a practice, and about must have been about three years later, my father told me about this uh, woman uh, that when she my dad had mentioned that I was a lawyer. Uh, she said, oh, I belong to a group called the Mattachine uh, Foundation, I think it was then, and um, I wonder if he'd give a talk to us. And so my dad asked, and I said, certainly. So I, I checked sections to 286 and 288A and uh, 647.5, as it was then, and the various uh, statutes that might affect people uh, committing uh, homosexual uh, acts. And what did you find? In now, the same would be heterosexual acts. In other words, Section 286 is um, having uh, sexual relations uh, with an animal or, or man through the anus. Uh, not animal or man through the anus. So there's a semicolon there, you know. Um, <laughs> right. And, of course, that includes women. A man with a woman. According to the New York Times, they'd have to arrest 20% of heterosexual couples in America today. Oh, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And 288A uh, involved oral copulation, copulating the uh, 
private parts of one with the mouth of another. So it, it also could affect uh, uh, heterosexuals. Very few heterosexuals were ever arrested for that. The meeting you went to, was it at someone's home? Was it a large group of people? No, I believe it was a home, and I don't think there were probably more than about 25 or 30 people. Men and women? Group. Men and women, yes. Mm -hmm. In those years, the men and women were very pleasantly together, and there weren't the schisms that there uh, turned out to be later. How did they receive you? Oh, I was very well received, very well received, because, you see, in those years, there were no... Um, homosexual lawyers at all. They were all very deeply in the closet. In fact, they were so deep that most of the people that represented gay organizations, as opposed to criminal cases, uh, were straight. Wasn't there some risk for you professionally to get involved with Mattachine? Danger in terms of losing clients? Uh, danger in terms of FBI well, investigation? Well, interestingly enough, the only time that they got upset is when I wrote a little card called Know Your Legal Rights, which was sort of folded over, and I wrote it, and I think Mattachine or someone distributed it to the bars. And, it, you know, it said basically what your rights are, and uh, they probably found this in the wallet of one of the people that was arrested. And this friend of mine, a classmate, in fact, who was with the city attorney's office, the prosecutor at that time, showed it to me and says, isn't this awful and horrible? Why was it and I looked at it, and I didn't tell him I wrote it. I said, well, look, are any statements of law there that are incorrect? He says, no, but, but telling people they don't have to talk to the police? This was before Miranda. And I said, well, if, if that's their rights, don't you think they have the right to know their rights? You know, and that guy just got peeved at me and walked away. Why was a document like that necessary, that kind of little uh, card? Well, a lot of people didn't know. They didn't have to talk to the police. They didn't have to admit anything. They could ask for a lawyer for saying anything. What year was this, approximately? Oh, probably in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, when he wanted a top secret clearance for a, a, a job in Defense Factory, he was an engineer, I used my name, and the FBI came and interviewed me, and they said, well, we understand you formed the uh, Mattachine Corporation. And How did the FBI, when they came to ask you questions about this friend of yours, how did they know you had been involved in Mattachine? Oh, they probably keep a dossier on me. They keep dossiers on everyone. Yeah. Under J. Edgar Hoover, who was, in spite of uh, whatever he was himself, seemed to be quite a homophobe when it came to others, probably wanted uh, the organizations that were formed checked into. And this was a corporation incorporated in California in, I believe, 1954, and I think was the first a gay organization incorporated. In the United States? Yes. I mean, the thing is, I know they uh, once went to, uh, someone once went to another lawyer, and he wanted $25,000 to incorporate, and I did it free. <laughs> he told me that much later. In addition to being involved in uh, gay movements, I was involved uh, with um, the Watts riots. I defended a lot of people there. In um, what year was that? 1968, I believe. And then in the early 70s, the Chicano Moratorium, where I defended a lot of people uh, that were involved in, in that movement. So I f feel that um, the only sadness I see is that these minorities don't get together in, in, in a human liberation movement rather than fighting each other, which unfortunately is what does happen. Which, which groups do you mean? Oh, the uh, Latino groups, the gay groups, the black groups, the Jewish groups. During that, the, the time that you were representing gay people, what did you see as the, as the legal landmarks in gay rights law? The legislature in 1961 changed the law from the old uh, lewd vagrancy statute where you could be arrested, uh, any lewd or dissolute person could be arrested for a vagrant, as a vagrant. That's a status offense. And in 61, it was changed where you actually had to do something. You had to commit a lewd act. And then later, the famous uh, consenting adult statutes, that uh, what consenting adults do in private is no longer illegal. If you do it in a public place or with children, it's still illegal, mm -hmm. you see. But doing it in a public place is now a misdemeanor instead of uh, many of them being felonies. Mm -hmm. 
And that was probably one of the big advances. Then the attitude, of course, of, of society. Uh, I'll never forget, um, they try to revoke a license of a uh, hairdresser, a cosmetologist, for being gay. What year around when? Oh, that was again probably in the late 50s. And I tried that, uh, and I won the case at the uh, administrative hearings. What, what was the nature of the case? Well, that uh, he was a homosexual and therefore he should be stripped of his cosmetologist license. So I told, I, I asked the um, administrative law judge, uh, whom I knew was married, uh, you know, that he should ask his wife uh, how many of the male hairdressers she goes to uh, she feels might be gay. And uh, I just sort of jokingly asked him uh, how uh, all of our wives and girlfriends would look if all of the gay hairdressers had their licenses revoked. And he chuckled at that one, and very amusing. Of course, we're not for the poor guy whose license is at stake, no. because, you know, he had a nice little shop, and uh, um, it would have meant uh, if he lost his license, uh, uh, it would have, you know, wreaked a great deal of harm to him and to uh, people that depended on him. So you worked for nearly 20 years. Uh, Probably, yes. Um, and I took the black cat case up the Supreme Court, not successfully. What was the black, the black cat case? Can you tell me a little bit about Yes, that? Uh, there were uh, a, a fairly large number of persons arrested at a bar called the Black Cat because they were kissing uh, the New Year in. So the, the, the case was they, the, a group of people were arrested for kissing on New Year's yeah, Eve. Yeah, right. Some of them really got beaten badly afterwards. Some of them, in fact, one guy lost his spleen uh, because he got beaten so badly by the police. Police, you know, do, uh, do sometimes or did sometimes go in for gay bashing. They don't anymore because the gay movement now has strength. Uh, they have gay judges now and uh, even gay policemen. One of the other victories we had um, is the Christopher Street West Parade. The um, police commission denied a permit to the uh, committee. Uh, I believe that was 1970, 71. 70. 71. I think it was 70. They wanted a million dollar bond in case uh, anybody threw rocks at them. What was the permit requested for? To have a parade on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, they had the Christopher Street Parade in, in New York, and they wanted a Christopher Street West parade here, and they set up a committee. So they refused to give them the permit unless they had all kinds. They want them to pay for police protection. They want them to put up a bond, all sorts of expenses. Police protection and, uh, is something that the citizens are entitled to, uh, to be protected in the exercise of their constitutional rights. Um, if some people get annoyed by it and throw stones at them, it's up to police to uh, um, arrest the stone throwers and, and not to prevent the uh, marchers from marching. And from then on till today, they've been uh, marching every year. And the parades have been getting bigger and better. Did you march in that original parade? Were you there at the parade? I was there, oh yes. In fact, they also had, um, I, I remember one of them, uh, I took my uh, eldest daughter, and uh, you know, to get her acclimated to people that, um, uh, others might not agree with, so to speak, just like I took her to uh, black and Latino rallies. Just as your parents set the tone for you in your views about others. Yes, that's right. You've, you've got, the same you've got to do that. Given all the work you've done for uh, gay rights groups and, and gay people over the years, um, I call this my Barbara Walters question, uh, what do you see as your greatest contribution uh, in that effort? I think probably the greatest contribution was the pioneering efforts that when, when uh, straight lawyers weren't interested in it uh, and gay lawyers uh, were afraid to take it up, um, I was able to at least get a start in the organizations going. And I think that uh, I, I may have been one of the pioneers. I mean, without flattering myself, I, I think that's a, a, a statement I can make. Anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to comment on? I think you've covered it very well. You're okay. really a very fine uh, oral historian. Thank you. you know? Thank you.
I'm going to clip that piece of tape and save it and play it back on my bad days. Uh, (laughs) I was really touched by what Herb said about my interviewing skills. But back in 1990, when I transcribed the interview, I wasn't so happy with myself and typed myself a note. I wrote, if you had paid more attention to being a good interviewer, you might have asked him what motivated him to help gays. I kicked myself for not asking that, but then it occurred to me I could ask Herb's daughter, Jennifer. I spoke to Jennifer the first time in February of 2016 when she called and introduced herself. I figured it wasn't good news. But there was more that Jennifer wanted to share with me than the fact of her father's recent death. So I invited Jennifer to be a part of this episode. Jennifer, what year were you born? I was born in 1962, and I'm the youngest of... uh four children. So do you remember your dad's work with gay groups? I do. Um, you know, I was uh, fairly young at the time. Mostly I remember his uh, ill-fated campaign for uh, Congress and the Democratic primary in 1974. I was a little uh, a little bit under 12 at the time. And, and as a part of um, supporting his campaign, um, I was around some gay groups and also uh, as a very young person went to my first Pride March. Do you remember what year you went to your first Pride March with your dad? Yeah, that would have been in, in June of 74. So I was a little shy of 12 at the time. Do you remember your impressions of it? I was, I was pretty overwhelmed. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, whether that was because of my age or just the general uh, outrageousness of it all. But, uh, but I was, my eyes were wide, I can tell you that. Do you have some sense of what motivated your dad in the first place? He really was somebody that I think my grandparents, as he mentioned, um, were very open-minded people. They taught him that you don't judge other people and that you stand up for people who are being bullied. I think my father also said, and it was certainly true of him, that you know he never knew when to keep his mouth shut. And, uh, and I think of that in a really good way. He he really believed in speaking up for people who needed someone to champion them. And um, I think that drove him in many ways, not just in his legal career, but in his life. And I truly consider that one of the greatest gifts that he gave to us. I certainly value that every day. How did your dad react to your being gay? I came out to him when I was about 19. Um, I think that, you know, while anybody is is nervous coming out to their parents. Um, you know, the fact that my dad had this whole um, history and legacy of being involved in um, supporting gay rights made it so much easier for me. My dad was always very supportive of both myself and my sister. At least I didn't have to wonder if he was homophobic or if he would reject me. Um, you know, so any nervousness I had was just about, you know, exposing something personal, not about, you know, the the, the question that so many of us face so many other people face, which is whether their parents will reject them or not because they're lesbian or gay. Was your sister out to your dad before you? No, actually she wasn't. Um, She came out later uh, when she introduced uh, a a former partner to the family. When you reflect on what your dad did, what does it make you think? Well, I have so many, so many thoughts about it. Um, You know, I think that it was really brave of him to take the positions that he did and to involve himself. Um, But I also think that in a way he realized that he could do it without threatening his safety because he was straight, he was heterosexual, and he wasn't gonna take the risks that a, a gay or lesbian attorney at that time would have taken. I think he always had a very strong sense of social justice that I'm very grateful he passed on to all of us. And I think he was, you know, he was really motivated by that sense of of outrage that um, people were discriminated against, and he saw it as his role as an attorney to stand up for people who needed uh, legal assistance, and and I think his gay rights work was really a part of that. Do you ever marvel at how committed your dad was to making the world a better place for gay folks without knowing how directly his work would affect his own daughters? I do. I really do. You know, I would just say that, um, you know, in addition to my dad's inspiration in his legal career and as a champion for minorities of various kinds and people who needed championing, my dad also just has always been very supportive of me and of my family and uh, my partner and my son. 
and that means a tremendous amount to me uh, personally as well. If you do a search for Herb Selwyn's obituary, you won't find anything beyond his family's paid death notice. Like Edith Ide, who we featured in an earlier episode, Herb's pioneering contributions have been largely forgotten. That's why it gives me special pleasure to tell Herb's story, to let him tell you his story, and to have Jennifer reflect on her father's life and how his selfless actions made a difference in all our lives. Thank you, Jennifer Selwyn, and thanks as always to our crew, Thank you, Sarah Burningham, Jenna Weiss-Berman, Casey Holford, Jonathan Dozier-Ezel, Zachary Seltzer, and Will Coley. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making a History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and the One Archives Foundation. Season two of this podcast is made possible with support from the Ford Foundation, which is on the front lines of social change worldwide. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to Making Gay History on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. So long, until next time. Bye.